A Dr. D, Dr. D, Dr. D. Dr. D, Dr. D, Dr. D. A Dr. D, Dr. D, Dr. D. Explain stuff. Hey everyone, Dr. D here, and in this video we are going to be covering Chapter 1 from our Brock Biology of Microorganisms 15th edition textbook. And this chapter introduces the microbial world. So let's go ahead and get started. So in this introductory chapter, we are going to be covering main concepts such as what is microbiology about and why is it important, the structure and activities of microbial cells, evolution and diversity of the cells, microorganisms and their environments, and the impact of microorganisms on humans. So let's get started with the first theme. What is microbiology about and why is it important? Microbiology is the study of, my, uh, the study of microorganisms and how they work. Microbiology revolves around two interconnected themes. These are the two main themes of microbiology. Understanding basic life processes. This is the basic science behind, uh, mi behind the microbes. So how is the microbe growing? How is the microbe sending signals? How is the microbe uh, deciding whether or not to form an endospore? How is, you know, what, what makes the microorganism tick? How does cellular signaling uh, occur in the microorganism? And then the second prong of microbiology looks at applying that knowledge, that basic science, for the benefit of humans. This is called applied science. So think about what is the role of microorganisms in our understanding of medicine, in our ability to improve agriculture, and our ability to use those microorganisms for their utility in industry and all the products that you can produce with the help of those microorganisms. And microorganisms are really all around us. Just look at this figure here, figure 1.1. You have image A, and in A you can see a community. And remember, in biology, a community means different species of organisms. Look at the microbial community here from a small Michigan lake. You have microorganisms galore everywhere you look in the environment. Look at uh, in B, a, a sample of sludge, a sewage sample. And look at the community of different microorganisms there. And you are no exception. The human tongue, uh, there's a host of different microorganisms living on your tongue. Uh, in fact, there are more microorganisms that live on your body than you have total number of cells uh, of your own. Did you catch that? So there are more microorganisms on you than you have your own cells. Now let me explain that in your mouth is still considered on you because it is not inside of your tissues. Uh, inside of your mouth, if follow that down to the esophagus, follow that down to the stomach, the intestines, and the colon, which is the lower intestine, and you will know that all of that is considered on you and not in you. So what's going on inside of your colon is still technically not considered in your body. It's considered on your body, right? So your skin is on top of your body, but also the inside of your mouth is considered on top of your body and inside of your stomach, inside of your intestines, inside of the uh, colon, uh, etc. All of that is on you, not in you. When I say inside of an organism, what I mean is inside of the actual flesh, right? Inside of your tissues. There should not be any microorganisms inside of your tissues where the microorganisms appear is on your tissues, and that includes the lining of your intestines. And if you were to count the microorganisms on you, which again it, it includes on top of your, uh, uh, you know, your intestines, lining the inner lining of your intestines and colon and such, uh, 
you have more microorganisms on your body right now than if you were to count your own human cells, you'd be outnumbered. Isn't that interesting to think about? Now that we know we're surrounded by these microorganisms, why are they so important? Well, they are the oldest form of life. Billions of years before plants and animals, we had microorganisms. Although individually small, they are the largest mass of living material on Earth. So if you took the biomass of microorganisms, that's the largest living mass on Earth. They outnumber us, like I just mentioned, they outnumber us on our very own bodies. So they're going to outnumber us in terms of total mass as well. They carry out major processes for bio-geochemical cycles. They are vital to our appearance as a species. Did you know the earth was anoxic billions of years ago? That means there was no oxygen in our atmosphere. And we can thank these microorganisms for producing the oxygen that we breathe. And we can thank them to this very day for producing the oxygen that we breathe. A lot of people uh, believe that it's plants and trees that produce the majority of the oxygen that we breathe. However, it's really thanks to the microorganisms, including the cyanobacteria, which are photosynthetic bacteria, and thanks to uh, the diatoms, which are photosynthetic eukaryotes, and obviously other types of algae as well, um, which are uh, un uh, multicellular or unicellular eukaryotes. Thanks to these microorganisms that are photosynthetic, producing oxygen, you're able to breathe right now. And of course, plants and trees play a role as well, but they're not the major drivers for oxygen in our environment. And not only producing the oxygen for our environment, but uh, all of these photosynthesizing microbes, plants, trees, these photosynthesizers are also like CO2 sponges through a process known as carbon fixation, they can take CO2 out of the air like a sponge, rem removing CO2 from the air, from the atmosphere, lowering that greenhouse gas in the atmosphere and making it more habitable for us as a species by preventing the climate change. These organisms can live in places unsuitable for other organisms. You can find them in extreme habitats. I'm talking extreme hot, extreme cold, extreme salt, etc. Extreme pressure under the ocean. And other life forms require microbes to survive. We'll be touching on this as we go on. But some organisms require microbes to survive for their very existence. Isn't that neat? So what do we use to study these microorganisms? Well, we can use microscopes. Obviously, these microorganisms got their name from being microscopic, being too small to be seen by the naked eye. Did you know that your eyeball can only resolve down to 0.2 millimeters? You know what a millimeter is, right? Well, think about 0.2 millimeters. Uh, this is known as 200 micrometers. That's about the resolution limit of your eyeball. Anything smaller than 0.2 micrometers is just too small to see with your naked eye. Does that make sense? And these microorganisms are typically smaller than 0.2 micrometers. Eukaryotic microorganisms are much bigger than prokaryotic microorganisms, but they all tend to be smaller than the resolution limit of your eyeball, which is what again? It is 0.2 uh, millimeters, which is 200 micrometers. So we need microscopy, we need special lenses in order to resolve the image and to magnify the image so that we can see the specimen. We need to be able to culture the bacterium so we can grow them in sufficient numbers to study. And to do so, they need medium, which is the, the either liquid or solid mixture containing the required nutrients that they need to grow 
and then we need to grow them to form a visible colony. So here you can see a petri dish with a bioluminescent, that means light emitting colony of the bacterium, uh, photobacterium, grown in laboratory culture on a petri plate. So look at this, this is an actual bioluminescent bacterium, isn't that neat? And what this is called is, it, this is called a streak plate. You have three zones to a streak plate, and in the third zone you see these dots. These are individual colonies, and an individual colony is called a clonal population. You have millions and millions. You could have uh, in a single colony can contain 10 million, more than 10 million individual cells in a single colony on a petri dish, and that's called a clonal population, which means that they're all clones, genetic clones of one another. Because bacteria divide by asexual reproduction, there's no genetic variability that happens when after asexual reproduction, after binary fission. A, a cell divides into two cells. Those cells are genetically identical. Those cells divide again into four cells, which are genetically identical. So pretty soon you have 10 million cells, as in a colony, and all of those cells are genetically identical. They are all clones of one another. So when you go into the microbiology lab and you see little colonies on your petri dish, just realize that each one of those little dots harbors 10 million or more bacterium and all of them are clones of one another in that particular clonal colony. Isn't that interesting? So recall from Biology 1406, what is a cell? What is a cell? By definition, a cell is a dynamic entity that forms the fundamental unit of life. Remember, viruses are not cells, nor are they alive. Remember that there are uh, unicellular organisms, uh, and there are multicellular organisms. There are prokaryotic organisms and eukaryotic organisms. All prokaryotes typically are, uh, are unicellular, whereas eukaryotes can be unicellular, such as the protists, you know, the protozoa, and fungi, some of the fungi. These are unicellular organisms. And then you can have multicellular eukaryotic organisms as well, such as you and me, right, the animals, the plants, uh, etc. Now let's look at some of the elements of microbial structure. So microbial structure, what do they t tend to have? Well, they have a cytoplasm. Uh, they have a cytoplasm. And remember, the cytoplasm is an aqueous mixture of macromolecules, ions, and ribosomes. And surrounding the cytoplasm, you have the cell membrane, also known as the cytoplasmic cell membrane. This is the barrier that separates the inside of the cell from the outside environment. All cells have a plasma membrane around the cell. Eukaryotic cells have a plasma membrane. Prokaryotic cells have a plasma membrane. Now the composition of that membrane can vary a little bit, uh, but all cells have a form of plasma membrane around the cell, eukaryotic and prokaryotic cells. Ribosomes. Microorganisms have ribosomes. Remember, this is the, the organelle that, that synthesizes proteins. Uh, now, keep in mind, although ribosomes are organelles, they are not membrane-bound organelles. Remember that prokaryotes do not possess, typically do not possess, membrane-bound organelles. And then you have a cell wall microorganisms tend to have a cell wall in addition to the plasma membrane they have an external cell wall of some sort. That does not mean all, but that means most. Most microbes have a cell wall and that confers structural strength and it has other functions as well. And it keeps the cell in a particular shape. You'll uh, learn later in the chapter um, that cells can be caucus shape or rod shape or spiral shape or vibrio or comma shape 
bacteria have different shapes to them and the reason they can hold that shape is because of the cell wall. Now some bacteria don't have a particular shape. They're called pleomorphic and the reason for that is because those bacteria don't have a cell wall. And keep in mind that animal cells like your cells and my cells we lack a cell wall whereas some other eukaryotes like plants and fungi they do possess a cell wall. This should be mostly review from your Bio 1 class. You have the typical prokaryotic cell. Here is a cartoon and on the right you have the electron micrographs of a bacteria cell and an archaeal cell. And then on the bottom you have the cartoon of a eukaryotic cell and, a, and a, I believe this is a scanning elect no transmission electron micrograph of a eukaryotic cell and remember that eukaryotic cells have membrane bound organelles whereas prokaryotic cells do not have membrane bound organelles uh, and what are the membrane bound organelles let me list some off for you right now the main membrane bound organelle people refer to is the nuclear membrane. You know the reason you have a nucleus is because the genomic material, the chromosomes, are inside of a double membrane called the nuclear membrane. Prokaryotes, they don't have a nuclear membrane. They don't have a nucleus. Their single circular chromosome is hanging out in the cytoplasm as nucleoid. Did you follow that? So Typically, all cells have a, gen a, a genome, have a, at least one chromosome. Prokaryotes typically have one chromosome, and it's circularized. Isn't that neat? Prokaryotes have a circularized chromosome. That means there's no beginning to the chromosome, and there's no end to the chromosome. It's just a double-strand DNA circle. And prokaryotes typically have only one circularized chromosome, one chromosome. And that chromosome is not inside of a double membrane known as this nuclear membrane, you see. So the, D the DNA then is just called nucleoid. It's nucleoid. It, this, if you were to take this DNA out, unravel it, it would look like a giant circle, right? If you were to untangle this DNA, it would look like one giant circle. Whereas with, with eukaryotic cells, you have, you know, let's say humans. Humans have 46 pieces of DNA, 46 chromosomes typically, and those are linear chromosomes, which means if you were to untang sorry, if you were to untangle them, they would look like one giant string with a beginning and an end. Right? Isn't that interesting? So anyway, the main membrane-bound organelle is the nucleus, you know, the nucleus which is lacking in prokaryotes. What are some other membrane-bound organelles of eukaryotic cells? Well, you have your endoplasmic reticulum, both the smooth and the rough endoplasmic reticulum. You have the Golgi apparatus. You have mitochondria. In plant cells, in plant cells you would have the central vacuole. You would have uh, the chloroplasts as well. These are all membrane-bound organelles and these are lacking in the prokaryotic cells. But remember what I said in the last slide, you do find non-membrane-bound organelles in prokaryotes such as ribosomes, you know, which are found in both eukaryotes and prokaryotes. And don't forget, microorganisms, especially the bacteria, typically have a cell wall in addition to the plasma membrane. They have a cell wall. See, this is the cell wall. And we'll discuss what the cell wall is constructed of later on. So again, this is what I was touching on in the previous slide, uh, where you're comparing prokaryotes versus eukaryotes. Remember that prokaryotes are generally smaller than eukaryotic cells by quite a quite a bit. Uh, a typical prokaryotic cell is about 10 to 50 times smaller than a eukaryotic cell. Eukaryotic cells 
are larger and they contain all these membrane bound organelles including the main one remember which is the nucleus but that doesn't mean that prokaryotes don't have DNA remember that prokaryotes typically do have a chromosome and it's a circularized piece of double strand DNA which makes up their chromosome which makes up their their genome okay so again no membrane bound organelles no nucleus instead they possess a nucleoid okay whereas the eukaryotes they do have a membrane bound nucleus and they're generally more complex and larger and they contain all of these membrane bound organelles and remember we talked about the genome very important that you have a genome and and the genome is the cells full complement of genes and those genes reside on chromosomes right again prokaryotes have a single circularized chromosome that aggregates uh, to form the nucleoid whereas eukaryotes have linear chromosomes you know with humans having 46 within the nucleus we also have much more DNA eukaryotes have a lot more nucleotides a lot more DNA like humans have over 3 billion base pairs prokaryotes it's usually a few million base pairs uh, so their genomes are quite a bit smaller prokaryotes may also have extra chromosomal DNA called plasmids these are small circularized DNA that can replicate independently of the main chromosome okay and these can have special genes on them that confer special properties like uh, there might be a gene on a plasmid for antibiotic resistance or there might be a gene on a plasmid that that codes for a toxin right so look at this this is your main chromosome which is the large circularized piece of DNA inside of a cell and then you have your tiny little guy this is a plasmid it's a small piece of circularized DNA that replicates independently of the chromosome and again it can harbor genes important genes such as antibiotic resistance or toxins and such okay and don't forget the the genome the genome of a prokaryote is in the millions of base pairs usually I believe with uh, E. coli for instance it has about 4.6 million base pairs if I'm uh, remembering correctly okay and remember that like I showed you earlier from the human tongue sample and the sewage sample and the lake sample in nature cells typically live in microbial communities and remember in biology community means different species uh, inside of a you know in an area they also undergo metabolism right cells undergo metabolism and microbes are no exception this is chemical transformation of nutrients you know you need to take up sugars you take up fats and then you could digest those sugars and fats in order to produce ATP in order to uh, promote you know the functions of the cell don't forget you also have enzymes to assist during metabolism you have other processes as well like transcription and translation going on in the microorganisms this is how they're undergoing gene expression so don't forget these are properties of all cells do you remember from biology 1406 that all cells undergo metabolism which again uh, includes catabolism and anabolism catabolism is breaking down substances anabolism is building substances um, you, you you know uh, genetic replication transcription translation would be anabolism breaking down sugars and fats for energy that would be catabolism this is all part all of the chemical processes inside of the cell are together known as metabolism all cells all cells grow uh, and they can grow from you know digesting the nutrients inside of solutions inside of the media that they're growing now obviously grow means a different thing to a prokaryote than it does to a multicellular eukaryote like you and me 
when you and me are discussing growing, that means growing up or growing in size, growing from a child to an adult. You know, this is organ, or organ development, this is tissue development, this is uh, your bones lengthening, etc. Maturation. But in prokaryotes, remember, prokaryotes are typically single cell creatures. So grow means a slightly different thing. Grow could mean, you know, uh, the cell grows slightly in size, right? Uh, the cell to mature, right? One cell to mature. Okay? And all cells evolve. Evolution means changes in gene frequencies over time or changes in genetic material over time. All cells evolve. Now, what are some properties of some cells? Some cells have the ability to differentiate. We're going to learn about how some, some bacterium, including Bacillus and Clostridium genuses, have the ability to differentiate from a vegetative cell into a spore, uh, an endospore, uh, to, to protect their, the, themselves, to protect their genomic uh, you know, complement. We can talk about how some cells can communicate with other cells. You know, this is called quorum sensing, where cells can actually communicate with one another, and and uh, you know, and and it's in the benefit of the of the community. They can s genetically exchange information. They can they can share genetic information with one another, even across species. You know, some cells have the ability to undergo what's known as horizontal gene transfer, which means sharing genetic information from one cell to another. It's fascinating stuff we're going to talk about. Some cells are modal. <clears throat> they have a flagella or some other form of motility that allows them to propel through, through media. Okay, we touched on this material. Now, a little bit about the history of life on Earth and the importance of microorganisms during that stretch, during that history, the Earth is 4.6 billion years old. And the first cells, these would have been prokaryotic cells, appeared about 3.8 to 4.3 billion years ago. And at the time, remember I had mentioned that the atmosphere was anoxic, so no oxygen in the environment. But it was due to these anaerobic uh, bacterium that over time life expanded in the absence of oxygen and the first anoxic uh, or anoxygenic phototrophs these are photosynthetic bacterium uh, came about 3.6 billion years ago and thanks to them one of their waste products was oxygen so as these bacterium these phototrophs grew, one of their byproducts, their waste byproducts, was oxygen. And so oxygen started to accumulate in the atmosphere. And over time, there was more and more oxygen to the level there is today. Uh, you know, now we have about 20% oxygen in the atmosphere. And it's thanks to these phototrophs, it's thanks to these photosynthesizers over time. And that's what allowed organisms like you and me to, to come about, these plants, animals, to come about about a half a billion years ago, we, were, we had the ability to come about because there was now oxygen in the atmosphere and we still require these microorganisms and require these photosynthesizers producing the oxygen in the atmosphere that we need to breathe to, to persist. And here you can see that uh, again, what what we were discussing, that the Earth is about 4.6 billion years old. The life began somewhere around, you know, just shy of 4 billion years ago. Cellular life pre uh, presented itself. The Earth was anoxygenic, so no oxygen. But those photosynthesizers, those cyanobacteria were able to uh, photosynthesize producing oxygen waste products and that allowed modern eukaryotes to come about algal diversity over time and then finally again half a billion years ago plants and animals and ultimately humans to uh, present themselves.
So isn't that interesting to think about that you and I breathe the waste products of other organisms. These organisms uh, grew over time producing the waste product oxygen and now we rely, it is vital for our uh, survival that we have access to this waste product from other organisms. That blows my mind every time when I think about it. And to this day, we require these algae, these cyanobacteria, these plants, these diatoms, these trees, uh, constantly sucking up CO2 like a sponge out of the atmosphere to lower uh, climate change and produce oxygen required for us to breathe so that we can live on. Isn't that interesting? Recall from Biology 1406 that there are three main domains of life three distinct lineages of microbial cells. We have bacteria, which are comprised of prokaryotic cells, archaea, prokaryotic, and then eukarya. These are the eukaryotic cell organisms. And we all are thought to have descended from the last universal common ancestor, known as LUCA for short. You see here, we had a last common ancestor some billions of years ago, and then from there branched off to the domains of life archaea, uh, I'm sorry, archaea, bacteria, and eukarya. Notice too, hopefully they touched on this in Biology 1406, but if not, realize that eukarya and archaea are more commonly related, more related than either is to bacteria. That's another of one of those mind-blowing things to understand that that archaea and bacteria, even though they look the same under the microscope, and even though they're both comprised of prokaryotic cells, um, they are very different genetically. Uh, archaea are much more like us genetically than they are to bacteria. That's why archaea and bacteria are no, not in the same domain of life, even though they share so many common uh, phenotypic characteristics. Okay, So it is thought that archaea and eukarya share a more common ancestor than either does to bacteria, the, which is the last the, uh, common ancestor, the last universal common ancestor. It is thought that there's about two, ti two times 10 to the 30 microbial cells on Earth. That's a lot of biomass. And keep in mind, these creatures can live anywhere on Earth, including extreme environments of too harsh for other organisms to live, like hot springs, glaciers, high salt conditions, high acidity, high alkalinity, high pressure, etc. Uh, remember, your this this is where your your um, archaea will live, and remember that ecosystems refer to all living organisms, plus their physical and chemical. Uh, environment. So if I'm talking about an ecosystem, that includes the community plus the environment. So not just the fish and the um, tadpole and the and the frogs and the and and the sharks, but the the actual ocean as well, for instance. Uh, metabolic activities can change habitats and affect other organisms. Obviously, the whole reason we have oxygen in our environment is the byproduct of this metabolic activity. So, so what the organisms are doing in, in, a, in an environment can affect the actual habitat and affect other organisms. And the field of microbial ecology is the study of microbes in their natural habitat and how that affects other communities as well, or other populations as well, I should say. In humans, 1 to 10 microbial cells per human cell. This is what I was touching on earlier for you. In humans, you have uh, more bacterial cells on your body right now than you have your own number of cells. Think about that. It's very interesting stuff. And this table just shows you just a taste of where these extremophiles live, these, these uh organisms that could live in extreme conditions. Remember high temperature, low temperature, low pH, high pH, high pressure, high salt. Wherever you look, every nook and cranny on earth has some kind of life on it. And that's how you can get such a huge biomass of microbial organisms. So microorganisms can be both beneficial and harmful to humans. Obviously, 
uh, we're dealing with a pandemic right now um, and uh, that's due to a virus not necessarily a living organism however many microorganisms uh, including bacteria fungi protozoa you know these little protists uh, fungi they can all cause human diseases so microorganisms can affect our health but they can also be beneficial just look at their uses in food in the production of fermented foods in agriculture sometimes they're vital for certain agricultural products and also in in industry as well we utilize these microorganisms in all aspects of, of different forms of uh, the products that we use every day and like I mentioned microorganisms as disease agents it's a big deal uh, with the advent though of vaccines and antibiotics we have been able to for the most part control uh, these infections however they continue to become you know more and more of a problem as more and more microorganisms become resistant to antibiotics and they adapt and there's evolution going on so we have to constantly evolve our ways of combating disease however don't forget that most microorganisms are beneficial I mean like I said you have more microorganisms living on your body right now than you have your own number of cells and many of those are what are known as beneficial uh, or probiotics take a look here what I was touching on earlier this is a this is a chart from uh, of data from 1900 the year 1900 and here's a chart of data from closer to today and in red you can see in r the red bars represent these are microbial diseases and the effects they've had on human death notice that in on, in the year 1900 the biggest killer of human beings was the flu and pneumonia followed by tuberculosis which is also a microbial disease gastroenteritis also a uh, microbial disease and it, it's not until the fourth tick down that you see that human that heart disease heart disease which is not a microbial uh, disease was you know the fourth leading killer of humans fast forward to today uh, you, you have to go quite a bit down the chart before you find uh, a microbial uh, you know a microbial cause of human disease and human death why because like I mentioned the advent of antibiotics vaccinations improved sanitary conditions and our understanding of germ theory and how diseases spread uh, isn't that fascinating that now we have learned so much because of the field of microbiology that now we can turn our attention to other causes of human suffering and human death and to focus on those and hopefully one day rid those as well. Another important aspect of the impact of microorganisms is their impact in agriculture where they have both positive and negative implications. So you can see the positive impacts of microorganisms is their ability to fix nitrogen just like they can fix CO2 which means remove CO2 from the air they can also fix nitrogen they can actually remove nitrogen from the air and from that nitrogen they can produce ammonia ammonia is needed by plants and plants can actually convert that ammonia to nitrites or nitrates you know things that they need to grow they can also degrade cellulose which humans cannot do and also animals cannot do and these cellulose degrading microbes exist in the rumen of rumivores these are animals like cows and goats that digest uh, uh, digest plant matter in order to grow they can regenerate nutrients for soil and water they can also uh, cycle sulfur by oxidizing toxic hydrogen sulfide into sulfates and sulfates are non-toxic and needed by plants it's an essential nutrient 
some of the negative impact impacts of these plants uh, of these uh, uh, microbes are is their ability to cause diseases in plants diseases in animals so you know with the good comes the bad but there's a lot of good that comes from microorganisms uh, you know in in agriculture here you can see what I was talking about you have nodules root nodules on soybean plant these these uh, harbor bacteria that can fix nitrogen fix gaseous nitrogen into ammonia and then the soybean plant utilizes that ammonia to grow you can see the, the nitrogen cycle by through nitrogen fixation you can form ammonia and then sulfate or sorry nitrate with the sulfur cycle you can take sulfur you can reduce that to sulfate um, and what what do plants do plants take the hydrogen sulfide they then oxidize that yes oxidize that to sulfur and then the plants can use the sulfate products from that reaction the the sulfur reaction in order to grow so sul sulfate is important for plants to grow nitrates are important for plants to grow and it's thanks to the microbial action that we have the access to these sulfates and nitrates and you you uh, you can see here the it's the rumen remember that uh, these rumivores these these animals that can digest plant matter you know they have these multi-chamber stomachs and in the rumen of these animals you have microorganisms that are able to break down cellulose which is uh, you know something that animals cannot normally break down for instance you and I cannot break down cellulose into glucose however with the help of these microorganisms these ruminant animals are able to break down cellulose into glucose and then utilize that glucose in order to make you know uh, to, to utilize that glucose for energy in the in the in the animal Another impact of microorganisms is their existence in our gastrointestinal tract of humans. Remember I told you that there are many microorganisms in your stomach, in your uh, intestines, your small and large intestines, colon, etc. And this, and here they have a lot of positive impacts. For instance, uh, the microorganisms in your digestive system can synthesize vitamins and other nutrients that you might need. And where they really come in handy is their ability to just take up space. You have good, helpful bacteria called probiotics in your intestinal system. And these probiotics, these, these helpful bacteria, they stick to the lining of your intestines and they take up space and that's their utility because there are some bad players out there there's an example of a black of a bad player called Clostridium difficile which is a bacteria that if if this bacteria takes over your guts takes over your intestines it actually secretes a toxin which can really irritate the colon causing colitis, causing bleeding, causing bloody stool, and a lot of human suffering comes from these C. diff infections, right? It's, but, but when there's a healthy probiotic layer in your intestine, well then those healthy bacterium do not allow these Clostridium difficile bacterium to attach, they can't take over, so you see the fact that they compete with pathogens for space and resources allows you to live a healthy life. Here you can see the stomach, the small intestine, and the large intestine, the colon essentially, and the types of co uh, communities of microorganisms that live inside. There are many different microorganisms that live in your GI tract. You can see here that in the stomach, which is very acidic with a pH of two or sometimes less, you have about 10 to the four cells per gram. In the small intestine where the pH is more towards, uh, you know, less acidic, I should say more neutral, you can have up to 10 to the eight cells per gram of 
uh, microorganisms. And in the large intestine, which has neutral pH, you have 10 to the 11 cells per gram. You have many microorganisms in your GI tract. And again, a lot of these are helpful. They are producing vitamins and other nutrients for you. And one problem with, uh, you know, common day antibiotic overuse, you know, the over uh, prescription of antibiotics, the overuse of antibiotics is that they will go and kill these helpful probiotics in your intestines, right? So now all these, this community that's helping you, that's taking up space, that's out competing pathogens, these microorganisms die and shed off of the lining of your intestines, thereby allowing pathogenic bacteria such as Clostridium difficile that I mentioned to attach and, and grow and populate the linings of your intestines. Now this is bad because that bacterium harms the intestinal lining. Okay, very interesting stuff to think about. Microorganisms also have positive and negative impacts on our food industry and food supply. The negative impacts include food spoilage. Obviously, food gets putrid or goes bad due to microorganisms. There are foodborne diseases. You can get uh, ill from eating uh, microorganism contaminated foods. And microbes influence how we harvest our food, how we store our food food safety, how we prevent spoilage of our food, all, all are with microorganisms in mind. Some of the positive impacts though is that we've improved food safety, uh, how we preserve the food. We can produce so many neat dairy products with the help of microorganisms, cheeses, yogurts, buttermilk. These are dairy products that would not be possible without the help of microorganisms and people know and love these items with these probiotics. And then uh, obviously other food products that uh, are fermented by microorganisms and would not exist without the help of microorganisms. Sauerkraut, kimchi, pickles, chocolate, coffee, lavin, breads, uh, beer, etc. And here we can see how some of the fermented products lead to our, our favorite meals. Uh, microorganisms are able to ferment glucose into different fermentation products. Some microorganisms form propionic acid, acidic acid, CO2 as fermentation products. This leads to production of cheese. Other fermenters produce lactic acid, which allows us to have uh, types of yogurt and types of uh, other dairy products. We have ethanol production. You know, uh, microorganisms can produce ethanol through fermentation. That leads to wine and beer and such. Acidic acid production, which can be used to pickle uh, cucumbers, to make pickles, to make fer the fermented foods that we love. Not only in, not only does the fermentation process help. Uh, produce the food, the characteristic flavor of the food, but it also helps to preserve the food as well. These are these these foods are, have a natural preservation to them to some extent. Microorganisms can impact our industries. When we form pipes, storage tanks, and with certain medical devices, we have to understand how biofilms, which we'll explain in a later chapter, how biofilms from microorganisms might grow and might affect these devices. In industrial microbiology, we grow massive amounts of microbes that are designed to produce antibiotics, enzymes, and some chemicals for us. In biotechnology, we genetically engineer microbes to produce high-value products in small amounts, such as insulin, for instance. And we can use microorganisms in the production of biofuels, you know, methane, ethanol. These are biofuels that we can use uh, in uh, our machines. And we can use them in bioremediation to clean up oil spills, solvents, pesticides, etc. Here you can see ethanol being used as a biofuel, and the ethanol is produced uh, by uh, these microorganisms that are capable of fermenting cellulose from, in this example, switchglass, 
uh, switchgrass, I should say, and cornstarch from corn. Uh, the the cellulose and the cornstarch are basically p uh, polymers of glucose. Microorganisms then ferment that uh, glucose into ethanol. So you have breakdown of cellulose and cornstarch into glucose, fermentation into ethanol, and then the eth ethanol is stored in these big tanks and used as biofuels, used in uh, flex fuel cars, for instance. Now, before we move on to part two of this chapter, microscopy and the origins of microscopy, since this is a new, uh, new area of this, of this chapter, let's go ahead and take a quick little break, give ourselves a chance to unwind, grab a drink or something. So let's take a quick break time with Gizmo and Wicket, and we'll be right back with more. All right, welcome back from break time with Gizmo and Wicket. Let's continue chapter one with our discussion of microscopy. So in this part of the chapter one, we're going to talk about light mic microscopy, improved contrast microscopy, imaging cells in three dimensions, and also electron microscopy. So microbiology, the field, began with the advent of the microscope. We can thank a couple of pioneers for this, Robert Hooke and Anthony Van Leeuwenhoek. Robert Hooke, using some early uh, lenses in order to describe microbes and publishing some of those early, early images, some of the first images of microorganisms in Micrographia in 1665. Anthony Van Leeuwenhoek with his pinhole microscope, he was the first to describe bacteria. So you can see Robert Hooke with his early microscope. Here's a, a drawing of his early microscope design and some of the some of the small microbes he was able to see. These are some uh, fun, fungi that he saw growing from a piece of leather that he had. Anthony Van Leeuwenhoek had, you know, uh, he was a haberdasher by day. Haberdasher is a men's outfitter of the time. So he would, uh, you know, provide gentlemen with uh, suits and hats, top hats and canes and such. But as a hobby, he would, on the side, you know, work with optics, work with lenses, and he created this pinhole microscope, which is a tiny hole, that's the pinhole right there, uh, with a lens in it. That lens was able to magnify almost 300 times, and the specimen would go on the tip of this pin, uh, and so he would look through this hole at the specimen at the tip of this this needle and he would he would look at and see shapes that we currently know as microbes he would find caucus shaped microorganisms he would see rod shape uh, spiral shape organisms as well here you can see some blood cells that he, he was able to resolve as well so with the advent of these this these optics these lenses that could magnify the microbial world, we gained an understanding of these microorganisms, and so was born the field of my, uh, microbiology. <clears throat> so this is now called a light microscope. When you're using visible light in order to magnify an image, and remember, visible light is, you know, it, it encompasses the the wavelengths from about 300 nanometer emissions to 700 nanometer emissions so from purple all the way to red visible light and with these uh, lenses you're able to magnify an image and gain resolution so what's the difference between magnification and resolution magnification is how many times larger is the object than this specimen really is. 
if the object appears twice as big as the specimen really is, then you have a two times magnification. If it appears ten times larger, you have a ten times magnification. Now, resolution, on the other hand, is how, uh, how uh, sharp that image is. Uh, it's the ability to distinguish two adjacent options, uh, objects as distinct and separate. So think about it this way. If I have two tiny dots and they're getting closer and closer and closer, at what point do those two tiny dots that are not touching, at what point do they appear as one dot? That is the definition of resolution. So the closer those two dots can get and still be distinguished as two separate dots, that is, uh, your, that is, that is your resolution. Okay? And um, without resolution, everything will appear blurry. And remember what I told you, the resolution limit of your eye was 0.2 millimeters. Well, the resolution limit for a light microscope is about 0.2 micrometers. So it's a thousand times better than your eyeball. So we're able to magnify and resolve a thousand times better than with a naked eye. Right? And that's why our microscopes have a maximum setting of 1000x when you engage the oil objective. Now, the compound light microscope uses a series of lenses, and there are two magnifying lenses. Remember, the compound light microscope is the same as the one you're using in lab. It has a rotating nose piece with objective lenses that change. Remember, there's a 10x, a 40x, and a 100x lens on there. That's the oil immersion lens. But you also have an ocular lens, an eyepiece and the ocular lens magnifies as well. That magnifies usually 10x, right? So your microscope effectively magnifies uh, between 100x and 1000x. That's your range that you're working with. And there are many different types of light microscopy. There's bright field, phase contrast, dark field, and fluorescence. Now the ones that you're using in lab are actually capable of these first three and the and the way you switch between these first three is by rotating the condenser remember the condenser either says a or o that is bright field microscopy you slide that condenser all over and if it says ph1 ph2 or ph3 that's phase contrast microscopy and if you slide that condenser again you'll see df for dark field microscopy so we're going to touch on each of these. Let's start with compound light microscopes. A compound light microscope uses visible light to illuminate cells. But not only that, it has two sets of lenses to form an image. Remember, you have the objective lenses. These are your, the ones that are on that rotating nose piece. And then you have your ocular lens, which is your eyepiece, which magnifies as well. So the total magnification is the product of objective magnification and ocular magnification. All right. So again, if, if you're on the 40x objective, you have to multiply that by the magnification of the ocular, which is 10x. So you're at a total magnification of 400x. And a bright field microscope, with the bright field microscope speci specimens visualized because of differences in contrast between specimen and surroundings. Um, now contrast is a term I need you to know. Contrast is how much the specimen stands out against the background. Okay, that's what contrast means. This is the reason we stain our cells. Sometimes you need to stain your cells. That's so that the cell will become purple or pink or green or colored in some way that it stands out better against the background. That's why we stain our cells. And here you can see a compound light microscope such as the ones we have in the lab. You can see it has the different parts that you should be aware of. The ocular lens, you have the objective lenses on this rotating nose piece, you have the stage, 
The condenser is the lens underneath the stage, and remember the job of the condenser is to focus a cone of light onto the specimen. Then you have the iris. The iris is usually right here. The iris is a diaphragm that restricts the light, and when you restrict the light with the diaphragm, you increase contrast. You have the coarse adjustment knob, you have the fine adjustment knob, and the light source. Okay, so this is a compound light microscope, and on the right with figure B, you can see how the light works. You have the light source travels through the condenser lens, with the condenser focuses a cone of light onto the specimen. The light then travels through the objective lens, through the ocular lens, and then it's visualized by your eye. And this is the types of images you can see with a bright field microscope. You can see this is purple phototropic bacteria and this is green algae. Now these are cells that have not been stained but have a natural stain to them. They have natural pigmentation and that's why they have a natural type of staining to them. However, if you're trying to resolve uh, specimens that don't have a natural pigment like chloroplasts for instance, well then you might want to consider staining your specimen so it actually has some contrast to it. Okay, so again, staining improves contrast. Dyes are organic compounds that bind to specific cellular materials. Now, most of the dye that we use in lab, remember we use dyes such as crystal violet, methylene blue, uh, malachite green, we use different types of dye, don't we, in the lab? Most of them are basic dyes. Basic dyes have a positive charge to them, and they work great for staining the overall cell because most cells are strongly negative charged at the surface. Most cells have a negative charge at the surface, so why not use a basic dye, a positively charged dye, that sticks well to that charge. Okay, again, methylene blue, crystal violet, safranin, these are all examples of basic dyes, and basic dyes are great for staining cells, so you can determine general shape of the cell, general morphology of the cell, arrangement of the cell, etc. Okay, and don't forget, we learned this in lab, how to prepare a smear you would take bacteria and spread it in a you know a circle circular pattern the size of a nickel or so on a slide allow it to air dry heat fix then flood the slide with stain uh, then uh, after the stain you gotta rinse it you gotta blot it dry with bibulous paper check it out under the microscope and then ultimately go all the way up to oil um, the oil lens with the immersion oil in order to resolve those bacterial cells. All right, and what are differential stains? Differential stains have, you could see different kinds of cells in different colors. So the most famous of these would be the gram stain. Uh, remember that bacteria have two different uh, cell wall architecture. In fact, we haven't touched on it yet, but in the next chapter I'm going to explain to you how there are two different architecture of cell wall for bacteria. Bacteria are either considered to have gram-negative cell wall architecture or gram-positive cell wall architecture. This is the way that their cell wall is constructed, right? And the gram stain distinguishes between these two architectures. So for example, E. coli has a gram-negative cell wall architecture, so it will stain pink with the gram stain, whereas Staphylococcus aureus has a positive cell wall architecture, so when you do the gram stain, it will stain purple. So a gram stain looks for differences in the cell wall structure. Gram-positive cells and gram-negative cells. How is the gram stain conducted? First, you make a smear of your cell. Then you flood the cell, you flood the smear, I should say, with crystal violet for one minute. This stains all cells purple. 
this stains all cells purple because crystal violet is purple. Next you have to add iodine. Why do you add iodine? Iodine doesn't stain the cell. Iodine acts as a mordant. What that means is it keeps this dye in place. The iodine will, will uh, join up with the crystal violet forming a dye iodine complex making the crystal violet less permeable which means harder to wash out of the cell. Next you're going to decolorize the cells with alcohol. So you add, uh, you briefly add alcohol dropwise and that washes the crystal violet out of the cells. You see, uh, in fact if you were to do this long enough all of your cells would become clear. All of them would get washed uh, and the crystal violet would, would get out of the cells. However, if you do this briefly, only the gram-negative cells, because of their cell wall architecture, only gram-negative cells will lose the stain. Gram-positive cells, especially with the help of iodine holding this, uh, the dye in place, gram-positive cells will not lose the coloration. Gram-negative cells will lose the coloration, will lose the crystal violet, so what happens at this stage is that gram-positive cells are purple, but gram-negative cells should appear colorless. And here comes the counter stain, the second color in the differential stain. We're, we're uh, staining with safranin, like a pink-red dye. And now those clear cells become colored pink. And even if the pink color gets into the purple gram-positive cells, they, you know, the purple is darker, so they still appear purple. And what do you see under the microscope? You see purple cells are your gram-positive cells, and the pink cells are your gram-negative cells. So it's a differential stain. Differential stains allow us to differentiate between different types of cells. Now, we, now that we understand how bright field microscopy works. What about phase contrast microscopy? Remember that our microscopes in the lab are capable of phase contrast as long as you slide the condenser to the pH setting. Now when you do that it improves the image contrast and it improves it in unstained live cells. The reason for this is simple. Light that strikes uh, the specimen will get slowed. It goes through a phase plate and that puts the light out of phase. So it, it effectively, what it does is it deletes that wavelength of light, making the specimen darker than it really is. It's like an artificial way of staining the cell so that the cell appears darker against the light background. Here you can see some uh, yeast cells under just regular bright field microscopy. These are unstained yeast cells. And notice here, with the help of phase contrast microscopy and no real staining, those cells appear much darker against the background and that brings out some of that natural contrast. Same thing with dark field. Remember we could slide our condenser over to the dark field setting with the DF abbreviation on our condenser. And that's another way of artificially uh, improving contrast but a totally different way. Uh, it allows only light that reaches the specimen to get collected into the objective. Any light that does not strike the specimen escapes the objective. So what you effectively get is a bright image on a dark background. So look here, this would be a dark field image where all of the light that did not strike our yeast cells, that light escapes the objective and is not collected, so it appears like a black background. Only the light that struck our specimen was refracted into the objective and collected by the objective. Therefore, your, your yeast cells appear bright against a dark background, and it gives you excellent uh, contrast in living cells especially if you're trying to observe motility of those cells you can see them swimming around and obviously you can't stain a cell that you want to uh, study motility because that would require killing the cell so you could look at live unstained cells that's pretty neat 
Now what about fluorescence microscopy? Fluorescence microscopy is another form of light microscopy, but not one that is readily available to us. It allows you to visualize specimens that fluoresce. This means that they have some sort of fluorescence property or they are tagged with a fluorophore, a molecule that fluoresces. But either way, you have to allow for fluorescence. So, and fluorophores or fluorescing molecules, what they do is they absorb wavelengths of one uh, or light from one wavelength and then they emit light of a different wavelength. Does that make sense? So a fluorescent molecule might absorb blue light and then emit green light. Uh, and that's what fluorescent molecules do. Okay, and one, one thing, uh, one fun fact for you. Flor fluorophores or fluorescent molecules always absorb light that's shorter in wavelength, which means higher energy light than the wavelength that they emit. They always emit a longer wavelength or lower energy light. So because of this, cells appear to glow on black background because of filters. So here you can see some examples of fluorescence in action. You can see uh, cyanobacteria, and th these are cyanobacteria observed with phase contrast microscopy, which is A and C, and by fluorescence microscopy in B and D. So here's, here's the cyanobacteria with phase contrast here in A and C, and the same cyanobacteria with fluorescence microscopy here in uh, B and D. You see how the cyanobacteria are fluorescing. Uh, they appear to be glowing against a dark background. Also here in E, you can see fluorescence of cells of E. coli. Sorry, this should be italicized. Escherichia coli should be italicized. Uh, these E. coli are glowing because of DAPI. DAPI is a fluorescent molecule that tightly binds to DNA. So what you're seeing here isn't the whole E. coli cell, it's the E. coli nucleoid, it's the E. coli DNA. What, what this researcher had done was treat their E. coli cells with a fluorophore called DAPI. DAPI binds tightly to the E. coli DNA. And what you're seeing here are all of the nucleoids for many different E. coli glowing in blue because uh, DAPI absorbs violet light and it emits blue light. Now another type of microscopy that's interesting, it's a type of light microscopy but not a type we have readily available to us in the lab, is differential interference contrast or DIC microscopy. This is an interesting type of microscopy that uses a polarizer to create two distinct beams of polarized light. Uh, essentially light in a single plane. You know that light travels in different planes. There you've got x, y axis, you've got, um, you know, you've got the, the, the uh, horizontal axis, I should say, and the vertical axis. You've got the vertical axis. So uh, just like the little glasses you get at the 3D movies, you know, the, the gray glasses they give you for 3D movies, this eye gets different information than this eye because this eye is getting uh, you know, the, the, the vertical axis polarized light, this eye is getting horizontal axis uh, polarized light, and then you can see three-dimensional movies. Same concept applies here with DIC microscopy. It uses these polarizers which gives, you know, structures such as the nuclei, endospores, vacuoles, inclusions, a three-dimensional appearance. So look at this. Here are those yeast cells under DIC microscopy, notice how they have this, this, this 3D effect to them, and it's because your eyeballs are getting different information. Now, confocal scanning laser microscopy, this is another interesting form of microscopy that we don't have available to us in the lab. This takes uh, the best of DIC and fluorescent microscopy and kind of puts them together. It takes you, it allows you to use lasers 
to look at multiple sections of a sample, right? And then feed that information to a computer algorithm, which then builds a, a three-dimensional model of those layers. So essentially, you're using fluorescence microscopy, but by looking at a sliver of your sample at a time, and then using computers to put all that information together and compile it into a three-dimensional image, you get these beautiful fluorescence three-dimensional uh, images. So you could look at, for example, a microbial community all together, and you could see the, it clearly, you can see what's going on in, the, in, in that community. For instance, a biofilm community. Now, let's say you want to study a specimen that's tiny. You want to study a virus, or you want to study the organelles inside of a cell. You want to study individual proteins. Now you're dealing in the realm of electron microscopy. So electron microscopes use electrons instead of visible light, instead of the wavelengths, remember, 300 to 700. We're talking about we're not, we're not using light at all. We're using the electrons, which have a very small wavelength compared to that of visible light. And this, these, these electrons are used to image the cells, to resolve the image. And instead of glass lenses, which would just block the, the electrons, we use electromagnets as lenses. We have to operate these microscopes in a vacuum because even air would block the electrons from you know doing their job a cam instead of uh, looking through uh, the microscope and seeing the specimen it's actually a photo sensor that receives that information so the electrons hit a photo sensor and that sensor sends the information to a tele television screen and there are two types you need to know about there are transmission electron microscopes, abbreviated TEM microscopes, and scanning electron microscopes, abbreviated SEM. Okay, Transmission electron microscopes, these have better resolution. However, you have to section your specimen. You have to, uh, you have to make slivers of your specimen and, and actually section it into tiny sections and you can see inside of the specimen where a scanning electron microscopy has a little bit a uh, little bit worse resolution but you can see the surfaces of specimens so if you want to look at the surface of specimens you want SEM if you want to see the inside of sectioned and sliced specimens you're dealing TEM so here is a TEM microscope transmission electron microscopy. You could see at the top here you would have your electron gun, which is essentially an electron source. The electrons radiate down through your specimen. And of course they have to go through an evacuated chamber. So it's a vacuum chamber. And the way the electrons get focused is by various electromagnets. This is where you stick your sample in. So the electrons cross, strike your sample, and go here to some kind of uh, re uh, you know receptor, which then which then projects projects the information onto a screen here. Now, again, with transmission electron microscopy, you have much greater resolving power. Point. 2 nanometers than light microscope. Look at this, 0.2 nanometers. 0.2 nanometers, that's ridiculous. Uh, remember, a, a light microscope had the best resolution at 0.2 micrometers. So uh, think about 0.2 micrometers to 0.2 nanometers, about a thousand times better than a light microscope, right? So a thousand times better resolve. Uh, res resolving power. So you can see a thousand times better than the microscopes we, we have it in the lab. And you can see structures at the molecular level. You can see, you can see individual molecules with, with uh, TEM. Okay, but again, do you remember what I said? You have to section the samples very thin.
and we're talking 20 to 60 nanometer sections and uh, and you can stain your specimen you can stain it but you don't stain it with dye like we do with light microscopy you stain it with high weight substances such as heavy metals right so silver or something negative staining allows direct observation of intact cells and components so you can either stain the specimen or you can stain the background either way you're going to be able to have the contrast you need to see your sample so take a look here here's uh, a few examples of TEM actually it's one example of TEM two examples of TEM one example of SEM let me show you in A you have a cell that is dividing that is dividing you see this is a cell with a septum septum occurs during binary fission when a cell is dividing into two and you see this is a section of these two cells as they divide you can see the nucleoid here the nucleoid here the septum formed here so this is a bacterial cell and look how much detail you can see of this bacterial cell okay and then here you can see this is actually a, a molecule it's a it's protein hemoglobin you know hemoglobin the protein uh, it's a quaternary structure so it's actually several proteins working in concert but you can see the hemoglobin proteins here with the negative staining what does that mean the heavy metal is staining the background and the light colors which are not stained are the hemoglobins and then in C we haven't touched on this yet but this is a scanning electron micrograph of bacterial cells remember I said with scanning electron microscopy you see the surface of cells so if you're ever seeing uh, electron microscopy and you see surfaces like this you know it's a scanning electron micrograph if you're seeing inside of cells like this you know it's a transmission electron micrograph and just to show you that yes researchers really do use all of these forms of microscopy all of these images are from my own work when I was a graduate student a PhD student at UT Southwestern and you could see I, I had these mutant mice I was studying and their 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 pancre pancreas was small did you know the plural of pancreas is pancreata you see this was a wild type or normal pancreas outlined in white of a mouse and then the mutant pancreas is is much stunted in growth and much smaller so is the stomach but uh, here are the three mice, the wild type mouse, heterozygous mouse, and the mutant mouse I was studying. Again, this is a bright field image of the stomach. Uh, you can see the pancreas is large. And in the, mutants, in the mutant stomach, you see the pancreas over here is quite small. Now with fluorescence microscopy, I used a fluorophore called GFP, uh, green fluorescence protein that fluoresces green wherever the pancreas is. You could see how big the pancreas is here with fluorescence microscopy and see how small the pancreas is here with the mutant with fluorescence microscopy. I then sectioned, sectioned the pancreata and you could see that with uh, this was bright field microscopy with H&E staining. You can see the pancreatic bud of wild type, wild type uh, mouse pancreas and the mutant, the mutant mouse pancreas. And by the way, these pancreata are from the embryos, not from these mice here. These are adult mice. These pancreata are from the embryos. So here you can see the pancreatic bud is, is developing nicely in the, in the wild type, uh, in the wild type mouse, but in the mutant mouse, it's not developing, it's not growing. And then I used uh, phase contrast microscopy to look at the pancreatic bud as well, to look at gene expression in the pancreatic bud. And then I used confocal microscopy to look at how the blood vessels are forming. See, I, here I stained blood vessels red, and you could see the blood vessels are forming nicely in the, in the wild type mouse, but in the mutant, you can see that the dorsal pancreas is not forming because the vascularization is not developing correctly. So you could see, oh, and, and here again, I also looked at insulin production in the pancreas. In the wild type mouse, it's fine, but in the mutant mouse, it was also fine. So you could see here, 
all the different types of microscopy we just talked about, maybe save the DIC uh, um, and dark field, but for the most part, researchers do use all the different forms of microscopy in order to answer different types of questions as they solve the riddles of life. So interesting stuff. Microscopy has always been fascinating to me, so hopefully you took away a little bit of information there about you know the types of microscopy and where you would want to use those for yourself. Now scanning electron microscopy, remember what this is? This is when you're looking at the surfaces of cells, right? And again, you, 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 your specimen is coated with a thin film of heavy metal such as gold or silver. And then an electron beam scans the object. Uh, it's an electron beam scans the surface of the object and that relays that information to a sensor. The scattered electrons uh, are collected and projected to produce an image. And then even very large specimens can be observed because you're looking at scatter profiles. And again, the magnification isn't as good as TEM but you can see the surface nicely. So now we're going to hop into part three of this chapter, how microbial cultivation expands the horizon of my microbiology. So what are the contributions of some of these early pioneers in microbiology? But before we do so, let's take another quick break time with Gizmo and Wicket, and we'll come back to finish this chapter. Hey everyone, welcome back from break time with Gizmo and Wicket. Let's carry on with this chapter. Now, here's some, here's some uh, concepts that I need you to know about. This concept of aseptic technique. Aseptic technique is a collection of practices that allows preparation and maintenance of sterile chemicals. It's essentially how do I get my bacteria from a culture to a sterile medium in a way that minimizes the possibility of contamination. And of course we learned aseptic technique in the lab. Remember that pure cultures are cells from only a single type of microorganism. Remember when a colony forms on a plate, that is an example of a pure culture. That is a clonal population. If I were to take that colony from one plate and streak it onto another plate, that is a pure culture of that colony. Enrichment culture techniques. So isolate microbes having a particular metabolic characteristics from nature. And early microbiologists had very important questions to answer. Uh, one being, does spontaneous generation occur? Spontaneous generation means life spawning from nothing or life spawning from dead material, right? Uh, early on, before the times of Louis Pasteur, we, uh, as human, we as humans believe that spontaneous generation may be a viable explanation for life, that, that, that life could come from uh, dead matter. And this answer uh, was brought to you by Louis Pasteur. Now we're going to talk about Louis Pasteur and how he disproved this concept of spontaneous generation. And two, what is the nature of infectious disease? What infectious agents, what, which specific bacteria are responsible for specific diseases? This was answered by uh, the postulates of Robert Koch. All right, so let's get started with Louis Pasteur. Louis Pasteur was a chemist by training. In fact, vintners, uh, these are people who make wine, uh, hired him in order to understand better the process of fermentation. Why was it that their wines were, you know, uh, that had variable consistency? Uh, at first it was thought that the process of fermentation and winemaking was simply a chemical process that occurs, but with his investigation, what he, what he realized essentially is that uh, there is a biological element. Fermentation is a biological process, not strictly a chemical process. And he developed this whole idea behind yeast, uh, 
being important for breaking down the sugars in the winemaking process in order to produce the ethanol. So he essentially discovered alcoholic fermentation and that led to a revolution in winemaking because now the vintners, uh, now they understood the importance of adding yeast and having cultures of yeast present in their batches to make consistent wine. Isn't that interesting? And as I mentioned before, uh, answering the question of spontaneous generation, that life could spawn from no life, he used his famous uh, uh, swan neck technique a swan neck flask technique to disprove spontaneous generation. I'm going to show you how he did that in a slide coming up. And he was very instrumental in the development of vaccines. Uh, he helped to develop the vaccine for anthrax, cholera, and rabies. Uh, so very, very influential person. Also, have you heard of pasteurization? Uh, this is the process of taking uh, a, a food that could spoil, such as milk, for instance, or beer, raising the temperature, subboiling, in order to kill off most microorganisms, and then cooling the, the 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 liquid without spoiling the taste. And uh, you know that's res that's responsible for extending the shelf life of milk. Right. So how did uh, how did Pasteur's swan neck flask experiment work and how did it disprove spontaneous generation? So what you could see is if you take a non-sterile liquid and you pour it into a flask and then you heat the neck of this of this flask into a into a neck it's called the swan neck then you you can sterilize the liquid by extensive heating, so extensive boiling. You can kill the microorganisms in the liquid and the steam is expelled out of the open end. Now once you cool the liquid, over time there, the liquid remains sterile indefinitely. So this, this broth, this, this broth essentially uh, is it remains fresh, right? Uh, it, it's not spoiled over a long period of time. And if you were to tip the flask or break the neck of the flask, within a short period of time, the liquid becomes putrid. Uh, it spoils. So what did this suggest to us? It suggested that the the microorganisms that were spoiling the broth were not spawning out of the broth. If they were spawning out of the broth, you know, with spontaneous generation, then they should spawn here and they should spawn here in both of these flasks because air is able to get in and air is required for life. So, you know, both of these should have spoiled. However, the reason this one didn't spoil is because the dust which carries bacteria, the dust was collecting in the neck of the flask. So the, the bacteria had no way to be deposited onto the liquid. Now here when you tip the flask over or when you break the, the neck of the flask, the dust is able to settle, the, the dust is able to get in and settle and to spoil the, the broth. Again, this disproves spontaneous generation because it suggested that microbial contamination occurs from dust that's floating in the air. It did not spawn from the broth itself, which is what people who believed spontaneous generation thought. All right, another superstar in the field of microbiology, another founder of the field is Robert Koch, a physician and microbiologist. What he's best known for is establishing a link between specific microbes and the infectious diseases that they cause. This is done by his postulates, his famous four postulates known as Koch's postulates. We're going to go over these postulates and how they work. But using Koch's postulates, you can link 
a causative agent for a disease to the disease that's caused. And by using his postulates, he was able to identify the causative agent, and by causative agent, I mean the bacteria responsible for, for instance, for anthrax, for tuberculosis, for cholera. And I'm, again, I'm going to show you how he did this uh, in a little bit. But in addition to all that, uh, his laboratory was responsible for developing solid media for obtaining pure cultures of microbes. In fact, you know the term petri dish or petri plate? Petri was a student, was a uh, uh, member of Koch's laboratory. And also, have you heard of agar? You know, agar plates? The agar was the idea of Fanny Hess, the wife of Walter Hess in Koch's uh, laboratory. She suggested the use of agar in plates uh, so that it wouldn't be runny like gelatin. Uh, because when people started culturing uh, bacteria, they used things like potato wedges, like, like the, they would cut a potato and use that to grow bacterial colonies. Then they moved on to using gelatin in the petri dish. That wasn't very good because gelatin tends to be runny at 37 degrees. And so it was Fanny Hess who suggested the use of agar uh, in the petri dish. And we've been using these techniques all along. Well, ever since, we've been using these techniques developed in Koch's lab. So he was able to make the culture techniques and able to link diseases with the causative agents. A very interesting, uh, you know, uh, very interesting person, very interesting times in lab, and, and very instrumental in launching uh, microbiology as a field. And for all of his efforts, he was awarded the Nobel Prize in Physiology and Medicine. So again, what did he show us? He developed ways to obtain pure cultures with agar plates, along with his associate, Walter Hess. Remember, it was his wife who suggested using agar. Walter Hess observed masses of cells called colonies. Now we know them as clonal colonies. And notice that these colonies have different shapes, different colors, different sizes. They started with those potato slices I told you about, but then moved on to gelatin agar. It was Richard Petrie who devised the Petri dish. It was Fanny Hess who suggested the use of agar. And we use many, many of these techniques today. So here's a picture of Robert Koch. And again, I told you I would mention his four postulates and how he used the postulates in order to link a particular bacteria to a specific disease. So what do you have to do? you find a diseased animal, okay, a diseased animal. Let's say it has telltale signs of some disease, and you want to figure out what bacteria is causing that disease. Well, let's go to step one. The suspected pathogen must be present in all cases of the disease and absent from the healthy animal. So what you would do is take a blood sample from this diseased animal and spread it on, let's say, a petri dish, an agar petri dish. You would then take a blood sample from a healthy animal and spread it on a dish as well. All right, and this bacterial sample, this 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 bacteria should only be found in the diseased animal, but should be absent from healthy animals. That's his first postulate. The second postulate, the suspected pathogen must be grown in pure culture. So. Uh, once you've once you've spread this on a plate, you pick that colony, you spread, you streak that on a plate, and you find individual colonies. You isolate the the bacteria from this deceased animal. You isolate that individual colony, um, and you streak out that colony on a plate. You have to be able to do that. And of course, you you should not be able to find that bacteria from the healthy animal. Number three. The cells from a pure culture, from this pure culture, you have to inject them into healthy animals, and those healthy animals need to become diseased. So what did you do? You took some of these health, these uh, colonies from, you know, that you that you harvested from this original animal. You take this bacteria, and you inoculate a healthy animal 
with the suspected pathogen. Does that make sense? So you have to be able to take the bacteria that you uh, isolated from the original animal, inoculate a healthy animal, and that healthy animal has to succumb to the same disease. It has to present the same disease as the original. And then as a final uh, step, you have to again be able to re-isolate the original uh, bacteria. So you have to take blood from this de deceased animal again and be able to find that bacterium again. And theoretically you should be able to do this over and over again. You should be able to do uh, this exact same procedure over and over again. Uh, the mouse dies of a disease, you take the blood, you isolate the bacteria, you inject that into a healthy animal, it dies, you can then retrieve the, the blood again, find that colony again, inject that colony again, and the, di and the mouse dies again. So you should be able to repeat this over and over again, and that establishes a link between that specific bacteria, that species of bacteria, and the disease that it caused. Right? And by doing so, he was able to identify the causative agents for several diseases. Now, I should mention that the efforts of Koch really solidified the germ theory of infectious disease that germs, these microorganisms, are responsible for, for infectious disease. This was highly debated at the time. At the late, mid to late 1800s, it was not known, it was not experimentally shown that germs cause communicable diseases, infectious diseases. It was really Robert Koch who showed that demonstrated real link between microbes and infectious diseases with his postulates. Before that, see, before that it was suspected that they caused disease but no direct proof. Uh, and the people who showed indirect proof early on, uh, before the time of Koch, was, were Ignaz Semmelweis and Joseph Lister. Let me tell you about these very interesting people. Uh, Ignaz Semmelweis was a Hungarian physician and he promoted hand washing. And when he promoted hand washing, this was uh, revolutionary, uh, especially in the uh, pediatric wards during, uh, you know, post uh, maternity when 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 moms would give birth. Right? Uh, he would he would say, okay, we need to wash our hands. And when 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 doctors wash their hands during the process, this lead to decrease. Uh, mortality of infants after uh, you know after they were born but again uh, he was ridiculed by his colleagues because his colleagues really didn't believe in germ theory of disease they thought he was just superstitious and even though he showed much better survival he showed that these children are surviving better and people are, are surviving better after hand washing uh, he was ridiculed eventually driving him to depression. He was committed to an asylum and he was uh, eventually beaten to death by guards. Isn't that a sad story? So Ignaz Samuelweis, you know, uh, really was important early figure in sanitation in the hospital setting. And it was a, just a terrible story here of his own colleagues uh, ridiculing him when he was ahead of his time. Joseph Lister, he was a surgeon, and uh, he was the first to sterilize his surgical instruments before operating. So what he would do, instead of just hacking off a limb, you know, with a saw, a rusty saw, he would uh, treat the area uh, with phenol, uh, a very powerful disinfectant, and he would also treat his surgical instruments with phenol. Uh, in fact, phenol is a sterilant. And then this led to improvements in recovery and minimized post-operative infection. So he was the first surgeon to sterilize his equipment, his uh, surgical instruments. But again, all of these were indirect evidence of the germ theory of disease. It wasn't until Koch came along linking a particular causative agent to a disease that we really started getting concrete answers as to what causes disease.
Another pioneer in the field, Martinus Beyerink of Dutch origin, he was able to develop enrichment culture techniques that we use to, to, to now, to today. Uh, this involves isolating microbes with a highly selective media by manipulating the nutrients in the media and the incubation conditions. He was also instrumental in describing viruses by discovering that viruses cause uh, disease. Uh, in, and he, he, he linked the, the tobacco mosaic virus to tobacco mosaic disease. Another pioneer, Sergei Wynogradsky of Russian origin, he discovered chemolithotrophs. These are these uh, earth eaters. These are microorganisms that are able to break down different types of uh, molecules for, for energy. Uh, this, this chemolithotrophy, oxidation of inorganic compounds to yield energy. Very interesting stuff, and we will talk about chemolithotrophy in a, in a chapter to come. All right, so with that, that leads us to the end of chapter one. Quite a long chapter, but then again, we're introducing an entire field here of microbiology. Very interesting stuff. Please let me know in the comments below if you have any questions, and I will catch you guys next time. Dr. D, Dr. D, Dr. D. Doctor D, Doctor D, Doctor D, a Doctor D, Doctor D, Doctor D, Doctor D, Doctor D, Doctor D, a Doctor D, Doctor D, Doctor D, Doctor D, Doctor D, Doctor D, a Doctor D, Doctor D, Doctor D, Doctor D, Doctor D.